to run first and so still there are times where he runs and crashes into things or Lily stumbles and falls and the first thing that she does and the first thing that he does is yell mama mama daddy even though we're not in the room we know that they are in our presence and they run to our arms and we don't have anything to give them as humans we have care we have love we have a band-aid but they find comfort and confidence that they can run to us and find healing in their heart. They find a type of bandage for their wounds, that they can find comfort in us and peace in us in their situation. It's the same for God. God is the father of the best father, the ultimate father, except he's got so much to give us. And when we call on his name alone, Jesus, Ow, Jesus, that really hurt in life. Ow, Jesus, I don't know what just happened, but it's not going right. We can run into his arms, and all we need is to call on his name, and he will provide. So this morning, if you're running around life and you've stubbed your toe or someone took your toy, or life's just not going the way that you thought it would, can I encourage you? to run into his arms. We're gonna pray for you this morning because here at Living Church, we are a family that prays together. So if you have a need, whether you're watching or you're in the room, I want you to raise your hand so we can agree with you in prayer to a God who provides, to a God who listens, who sees your need and provides in his time with his provision. God, we love you. You see every hand in the room. You see every comment of pray for me. Lord, and we pray that you would provide in every area that needs provision for your children. Thank you that we can trust in you, God, that we have confidence that you will provide every need according to your will, God, as your scripture and your word says, God. Lord, as your children are running to you by raising their hand and saying, God, me. Lord, I pray that you would give them the peace, that you already see it. You're already making a way where they see no way. Lord, and you're going to do it again. You're going to provide again and again so that your name can be glorified. We thank you, God, for what you're going to do. We can't wait to hear the testimonies of your provision. In your name, we 
we pray. Let's keep worshiping together, Living Church.
into whatever you have for us, Jesus. Lord, I thank you that this morning, Lord, we get to worship you. God, and we get to remember that you are the champion of it all. God, that you're so good. You're so good to us, Jesus. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah, Living Church. Thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. We're so excited that you're here with us. But before we go any further, why don't you take one second and just say hi to some of the people around you. Give them a nice wave. Tell them you're so excited to see them here at the church this morning. Y'all made it. Hey, extra props to these guys. Come on. They're, they, they got here on time. Yep. Right? I hope you're on despite time. Despite the time change, despite the weather, y'all are here. And it's spring Come break. Come on. Come on. Spring break. That's right. Yo, that's a trifecta. You get triple points in your crown in yes. heaven today. Yes, that's Come on, right. somebody. Come on. That's it. In fact, can we take a moment and welcome any first time guests that came here this morning today yeah. or are watching online? We love online. those guys. If they, if they made it here as a first-time guest, despite all of those They're super holy. Man, that's the truth. That's true. That's true. Doubt. We'd love to make sure that you were well taken care of today, that you had a safe, sanitary, and spectacular experience. You can scan this QR code right here, and I hope you'll also stop by the Welcome Center in the lobby. Hey, I saw the stuff we're giving out to these first-time oh, guests. I mean, it's legit. It's some good stuff, y'all. So those that are watching online that haven't been here in the building yet, come on Ooh, now. Yeah, you should do get it. here. We got some good stuff That's for you. That's true. We have you some get incredible here. gifts for you, but don't say all that it is. Because no, then gonna. people who've been coming for a while are going to try to get hey, a bag I know what and the take hook a home is. with That's them. That's a hook. That's we true. Get these That's people true. Here. Go Come by. On. Stop by the Welcome Center. Get yes. your gift. We hope you'll stick around and be a part of the family of Living Church. Yes. Y'all, we're in a really fun season. Oh, we are. Because Easter is back, y'all. It is it's coming back. up fast. You know, last year it's we didn't get to meet for Easter. We had our drive-through Easter egg hunt, but this year year Easter is happening yeah. how many of you are excited about Easter let me see your hands come Why on don't you toss them well you know I, I brought cheer? I brought a bag out here okay because I come bearing gifts y'all all right I come all right. bearing how gifts how many of y'all let me ask again are excited about Easter at Living Church yeah yeah I'm oh, gonna throw some okay. stuff at y'all I'm gonna do it I see your hand I see you I see you. oh okay all He's the way gonna, back he, he I'll get you that I'll get it to you I'll get it to you. Oh, you want to join in you on this? You got a lot of eggs in there. You got to throw them fast. I'll throw them. I'll chuck this thing like a machine gun. Here we go. I just can't ready throw for this? this one broke. I don't care. I'll still throw it. <laughs> it's, it's okay. Yeah, but we got to save some for second service, though. We got to save some more. Okay, that's enough. That's enough. Okay. There's something flying. I don't know. These don't are some happened. actually some good gifts because those are certificates to the Living Church store. Yeah. Y'all get you some free merch in the house. We hope that you are going to stick around and be a part of Easter at Living Church, but we know that Easter is more than eggs. Oh, for sure. Yeah. In fact, we want to make it as exciting and a wonderful time for you and your family, but not just for you, oh, look but at this. for all the people. Look at this. For all the people. We have got tools for you to invite all the people to Easter at Living Church. Yeah, we look got Easter eggs that we throw to you guys this morning, but that doesn't stop. Sign this is double the size of the regular yard cards right. you might see. Because y'all know how we do at Living Church? Bigger is better. Bigger is better. Go right? big or go home. I mean, and come so on. today you can take one of those with you. We have door hangers that you can take and you can give to your neighbors. Just slip them on there. Y'all be all the time. People be coming trying to sell us stuff, putting stuff on our door. But how about an invite? To we can be selling them Jesus Come on, at Living Church. Come but, on now. But it doesn't just end there. We're going to together as a yeah. church body go and do door hangers. Yeah, Saturday. it's going to be really, really cool. It. Well, we're going to we're gonna all meet at our, I think our Matlock building, at right? At Willie Pig, right Oh, we're going to meet here? Let's here do this here. Here at Willie Pig, 10 a.m. I got to get caught up on the announcements. 7th. 
and we're going to have a great time. We're going to have a fun time. For Easter. There's a method to the madness, too. I know we're going to split up into groups and we're going to tackle different That's different right. neighborhoods. Different neighborhoods different and we're going to yeah, we're going to hang door uh, signs and and then I don't know, I might take a bunch of these yeah, and just, just stick them in random yards. people's yards. Yeah, they're going to love that. I'm sure. I might do that. They might. They might. I don't think know. It's a one wonderful thing. Why not? But on March 27th, meet together. It's a great time that we go and just canvas the neighborhood. Just tell people everybody's going to be looking for a place to go on Easter, but you know that this is going to be the place to be. It is. It really so is. So we're going to have our petting zoo and our family photo booths and an incredible worship experience, but we want to invite them to come and be a part. Yeah, for sure. And then on Good Friday. Yes. Good Friday is going to be a special time too. That's but right. But hey, that's on Friday. On Friday. You know, the Friday you know, before Easter. This is actually going to be the second event on Friday that we're going to be doing. Yeah. We also had an event last Friday. How many people know what I'm talking about, what we did oh last Friday? Oh you guys word. are in the know. Those of you that don't know, last Friday we met at the Matlock building and had a fun night and it was a blast, y'all. We played bingo, y'all. We played bingo. Hey, Tristan and I announced, Wendy and Rachel announced, we were calling the little I-36. Oh, come on. Oh, 79. We did it, and we had some spice to it, so we had a lot of fun doing it. So, hey, we had a blast last Friday. We're going to have a great time. This on on Good, Friday. Good Friday. It's going to be a little bit different, a little yeah. bit different vibe. That's and true. together, we're going to watch the passion of the Christ. Yeah. And so, if you've ever seen that, it's a great uh, display of the true cruci crucifixion story. Don't worry, moms and dads will also have child care. So, your kids are going to grow in fun, faith, and friendship while we together as a church body watch this incredible movie, this incredible display of the true story of the Yeah, of it's, a great, it's a great way to set our yes. minds uh, you know what happened over 2,000 right. years ago. That's right. That's right. So awesome. I hope you'll come and be a part. 6:30 on uh, Good Friday at the Matlock Building. Last but not least, y'all, I just want to thank you for being faithful to God. Yeah. I want to take a moment, in fact, and thank those of you who watch online, whether yes. you're in the DFW area or whether you're around the nation. We're so grateful for your faithfulness to give to this we house. We couldn't do the things we're doing without your faithfulness. Easter really would not be able to happen. People would not be able to know the love of Jesus yeah. without your support and your faithfulness to tithe and to give into God's house. And so I just want to say thank you. Yes. I want to say thank you to those online. I want to say thank you to those that are here in this space. You can give by scanning this QR code. You can give at livingchurch.com slash give. You can text a dollar amount to 84321. Or if you're here in the building, you can give in one of the giving stations as you leave today. But God is so good. We got you covered. And he is so faithful. And as we give, his faithfulness never ends. And That's so right. I just want to encourage you to get ready and, and to keep being faithful. Yeah, for sure. But hey, listen, we're going to move forward That's right. and get ready to jump into week two of this amazing week series. Week two of More Than Eggs. It's going to be so wait. good, y'all. Are ready, you excited? Guys. Get ready, get Are ready, get ready. ready. Come on. All right, here Let's we go. It. It's going to be so good. Good morning again, Living Church. Man, so glad that you're here. If we haven't met yet, my name's Trustin. My wife and I, Rachel, are the pastors here at Living Church. We're super excited that you're hanging out with us. Man, week two of More Than Eggs. Can I tell you that Easter is only 21 days away? 21 days from now, three weeks from now, we're going to be celebrating Easter Sunday, and we couldn't be more excited. That's why we're throwing a massive party. How many of you have been to Easter at Living Church before? Man, you know that we go for it. It's a ton of fun. We want you to make sure that you're here with some of your friends like Pastor Whitney and Pastor Aaron just said. We're going to be doing family photos. We always do a big family photo booth so that you and your kids can be getting some cute pics. You know that you're going to want to have these so you can be posting them on Facebook, Instagram. So we're going to be having that. We're also going to be having a train ride. Rachel and I, we jumped on the train uh, this last year at Christmas. And so you can jump on the family train. That's always a lot of fun. We're going to be passing out snow cones to all the kids and all the families that come. I know my friend Aaron eats like six snow cones and he gets like all hyper after the second service, so watch out for that. We're gonna have a petting zoo, all kind of crazy animals out there, and our worship experience is gonna be something that you do not want to miss. Along with that, all of the kids are gonna be getting some free eggs. Every kid goes home with a dozen eggs 
And you know they're full of some good candy. We don't do that cheap candy here at Living Church. We go for it. We're going to sugar them kids up on Easter. Man, it's a lot of fun. But I want to encourage you not to come alone. Not to come alone. Don't just be here for the festivities yourself. But who are you going to bring? Who are you going to invite? Who's going to be a part of your Easter celebration? As a pastor, one of my very favorite moments is when people get baptized. But a little more specifically is when they get baptized and they address somebody in the room. When they talk about how somebody in the room did something or said something that created life change in them. And what if, through an Easter invite that you made, this year somebody made their public declaration of faith. They washed away the old them and they resurrected in the new them because you simply invited them. Can I tell you, I promise that we're going to give them a clean crisp gospel message that they're going to understand the goodness of Jesus but it's your job to invite them to come into this house to hear about how much God loves them they might come for the eggs but they're going to walk away with something a lot greater amen and so uh, man eggs are a cultural part of Easter they don't really have anything to do with the real meaning but they're a lot of fun did you know that since the year 1927 we've had a Easter celebration at the White House here in America that since 1929, the President of the United States hosts a party, and they have a bunch of kids that line up in these little lanes. They even do it today. They get these lanes, and they put an egg down, and they give kids a wooden spoon, and the kids have what's called an egg race. And the kid who wins, their family never has to pay taxes again. (laughs) If that was true, I would have Titus running drills in the backyard, like, every single afternoon. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. But they celebrate Easter all around the world. They don't do what we do here. Some countries, they have what's called an egg dance. And they take eggs and they place them on the floor. And they turn music on and they have like dance competitions. And the people have to dance without breaking an egg. It's one of the ways that they celebrate Easter. Then here in America, you know that we do the Easter egg hunt. We have all these opportunities for people to come together and connect. And we love the Easter egg hunt. Yes, yes, I know. Eggs are a central decoration of Easter, but Easter is really about a lot more than eggs. It's about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Come on, that's a good amen place. It's about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. The reason that we can come to celebrate is because we serve a risen king, and that's what Easter is all about. And so we're walking to and through the Easter story. I wanted us as a church to really get a grasp on everything that was happening around the Easter story. And so last week, quick recap, we talked about the triumphal entry of Jesus. If you, how many of you were here last Sunday? You were here? Good job at being back. Man, okay, so let's catch you up. We walked about the triumphal entry. Jesus' disciples borrowed a donkey. Jesus jumps on a donkey. He rides into town. Everyone's singing Hosanna, Hosanna, waving palm branches. It means victory and save us from our Roman oppressors. The first place that Jesus goes is to the temple. He starts wrecking shop, and he starts flipping money changers' table over because they're taking advantage of God's people. Then he has the Last Supper. He gets all of his disciples together, and they have communion. He washes their feet and shows that he's a servant, not someone to be served. Then he calls out Judas that Judas is going to betray him. And he prophesies that Peter, by the end of the night, will even deny that he even knew him. Last week, we ended off at the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane is an olive garden that's on the side of a hill. And so we pick up the story in Matthew 26, verse 36. It says this, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane the Olive Garden. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. Y'all sit here. I'm going over there. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. So Jesus, at this point, has 11 disciples with him because he already, Judas already left to betray him. And he says to seven of the guys, y'all stay here, but you three, Peter, James, and John, I want you three to come with me. Sometimes in life, certain people can't go with you to the places that God wants you to go to. You've got to look at seven. You've got to look at a large percentage and say, hey, hey, you know what? You've been real good for me along the journey, but at this point, I've got to only take the people that can really be faithful with me into this next season. Sometimes the only way to really hear from God is to separate ourselves from the distractions. 
Jesus is in the garden to pray. He's in the garden before his death to hear from the Father, and he has to remove the distractions. And it goes on, and it says, And he, he, Jesus, began to be sorrowful and troubled. Have you ever been sorrowful? Have you ever been troubled? Have you ever been stressed out? Have you ever been anxious or overwhelmed? Have the problems of this world ever made you feel like you just can't figure it out? Jesus understands what you're going through. You know, the Bible says that Jesus is a high priest who can sympathize with us. That he doesn't not understand what it means to have heartbreak, being betrayed, and having people turn their back on him and feeling like he doesn't know what's next. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, to who? The three, the three that went with him. He said, my soul, my mind, my emotions, my feelings, my my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Then he says to those three, now you guys stay here. Now keep watch with me, keep praying, but I have to go a little bit farther. So Jesus said to the seven, I want you guys to stay here. You three come with me. I'm going to bear my soul to you. I'm going to open my emotions up to you. I'm going to talk about how I'm feeling. But now Jesus says, stay here because I have to go a little bit further. Sometimes only you can walk into God's presence to hear what he's speaking. We can't always just rely on John. We can't always rely just on Peter and Andrew. We can't just rely on the people we've always relied on because sometimes we have to get alone and get still and get quiet and go into our little prayer room with ain't nobody else watching so that we can really hear what God is trying to say to us. He Stay here and keep watch with me. And it says, and he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed. He got submitted, he got humbled, and he said, my father, this is super important, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. What's he talking about, this this cup, this cup? He's talking about the crucifixion. Jesus had already predicted his death. He had already told the disciples what was going to happen. He had already been anointed by Mary with perfume to be ready for his burial and when he's saying father if this cup could pass for me he's saying god this weight this task this thing that i know that i'm called to do this responsibility i'm nervous about it it's heavy he's saying father if there's any other way other than the cross let it be you see jesus was fully god but he's also fully man He's going to feel every drop of pain that comes from the cross. Every whip, every nail, every punch, every thorn in his crown, he's going to feel. And in that day, Jesus would have seen crucifixions happen before. And he's saying, Father, if there's another way, let's do that. But if this is the only way, your will be done. Father, your your will be done. Then in the story, Jesus, now he's got the seven and the three, and and he's over here praying, and then Jesus, he says to himself, I need to go check on my boys, check on my disciples, make sure they're praying with me. And he gets up to go and check on them and go see what they're doing, and they're sleeping. They're sleeping. Sometimes the people that you need most fall asleep in the season that you most need them. It's like, seriously, guys? I said I'm about to get killed. Like, I just fed you bread and wine and said, this is my body. Like, it's about to go down, and you guys are asleep. God's always listening. God's always willing to talk. And if you feel like everybody in this world is asleep on you, you got to understand who you need to be talking to. So this happens three different times as Jesus is praying and it says in Luke 22 verse 40, 41 and he withdrew from them about a stone's throw not real far and he knelt down and prayed saying father if you are willing remove this cup from me nevertheless not my will but your will be done not my will but your will not what I want but you want whenever Rachel and I go out on a date night it happened last night we go out on a date night to go get something to eat and I say to her husbands you know my pain you say, hey, baby, where do you want to go to eat? And she says, 
<laughs> she says, I don't care. I don't care where you want to. We'll go anywhere you want to go. You know what she's saying? Your will be done. Anywhere you want to go. I don't care where we go. So I said, oh, you don't care where we go? Jackpot. We're going to Big D's Barbecue. I'm about to go get some barbecue. I'm about to get some brisket and some ribs and some jalapeno sausage. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to get some barbecue. And you know what she says? She says, uh, you, you know, man, I, I, I'll go. I'll, you know, I, I don't want to go there. I, I don't want to go there. Like, I thought you said that you would go anywhere. I thought you said, my will be done. And husbands, you know the pain, because your wife says she doesn't care, but then she starts putting some stipulations on where you pick. Isn't that exactly what we do to God sometimes? We say, hey God, I want your will in my life. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to do whatever you tell me, but I don't want barbecue. God, I'm going to say yes here and say yes here and yes here. But when it comes to my parenting, don't talk to me, God. When it comes to my marriage, don't talk to me, God. Don't be letting that pastor talk about my money. I'll be getting real mad and quit coming to the church if he starts talking about money. God, I'll listen to your will anywhere you want. But we start putting on these stipulations and saying, I don't want to hear about that. But when you get to a point in your life where you can pray and say, God, your will be done and not my will be done, you're finally at a point to step into all God has for you. When we finally say, hey God, not my will, not my way, I don't know what to do, we finally are positioning ourselves to step into everything that he has. The will of God is the greatest and safest place you will ever be. The center of God's will is safer than any castle. There's more provision in God's will than in any bank vault. It's the safest place that you can be. When Peter got out of the boat to walk on the water in the middle of the storm, it looked really unsafe, but yet it was the safest place on earth he could have been because he was stepping into God's will. And Jesus is saying, Father, I don't want to do this. <laughs> like in my flesh, I don't want to go through this process, but I trust you, and so I'm going to step out into what you're calling me to do. We can't put stipulations on God. Sometimes we want life to only be easy. Sometimes we want our faith to only be easy. But Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. He said, hey, sometimes things are going to be difficult in this life. In this world, you will have trouble. But you've got to follow God's will. Take heart. He has overcome the world. Luke chapter 22, verse 43 goes on. Now Jesus is off and praying and saying, God, I want your will. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. So let's look at the story. Jesus, he got alone, he prayed, he submitted his will to God, and an angel came to strengthen him. He prayed, and an angel came to strengthen him. You see it? It's right here. Let me read it again in case you missed it. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven. The problem with not praying is that angels don't receive their assignments. I think the greatest tragedy of prayerlessness is the unemployment of angels. I mentioned Big D's earlier. It's one of my favorite restaurants here in Mansfield. And if you go, tell them Pastor Trustin sent you because then when I go, they're going to give me a free lunch is what happens. <clears throat> Pastor Whitney and I talked about fuzzies the other week and like the whole church went to fuzzies that Sunday and we came in later. They're like, what happened on Sunday? Like all the church came that Sunday. I'm like y'all need to tell them it was me. They're going to be like, Pastor Trustin, you're the best. Here's a free lunch. <laughs> so when I go to Big D's, here's what happens. I walk up. And I talk to the lady at the register, I tell her what I want, and she writes it down on this little ticket. And she takes that ticket, and she clips it to a little clip that's on a wire. She writes down on a you know, two-meat plate with some uh, skilled potatoes, good God, so good, and some green beans. And she, uh, and she says, okay, that's what you want. And she goes like this. 
and she throws this little thing, and it like flies over here to the, to the meat angel. And this guy is over here, and he pulls out the brisket, and he starts chopping it up, and he gets the sausage, and he's chopping it up, and he puts it on my plate, and then he calls my name, and he says, uh, here's your lunch. Uh, I say, thank you, Mr. Meat Angel, and so he gives it to me. Do you know all that I did is I prayed a prayer? I go to the lady at the register, and I say, here's what I would like, and she writes it down, and she sends the assignment to the person who can actually do something about it, and then I now receive the thing that I wanted, and sometimes we have not because we ask not. We don't have the things that God desires for us to have because we do not yet have the faith to pull down the promises that he has for us. The meat is already cooking. It's actually been being smoked for 20 hours. It's being getting ready. His left hand has been preparing it for us. But we don't pray the prayer to get the thing. Can I tell you that Paul prayed in the middle of a storm and an angel showed up? That Daniel prayed in the middle of a lion's den and an angel showed up. That Peter prayed in prison in shackles and an angel showed up to set him free. And Jesus in the garden prayed up and an angel came and strengthened him. I know you're tired and I know you're stressed out and I know you feel alone, but have you prayed about it? Don't just listen to a sermon series about how to hear from God without getting alone in the closet and talking to God about it. I love you. I love you, but we got to pray about the things that are hurting us in life. So, Jesus is under this immense stress. Why? Not just because of the physical beating that's coming, but because of the spiritual ramifications that he's about to go through. See, Jesus is taking on the sin and the pain of the world, of all of humanity, of every sin that you and I have ever committed. Jesus paid for our sin in advance. Jesus paid for the sins that I'm going to commit tomorrow back then. The cross is a completed work. He's already paid for the sins that you're going to commit. You just have to ask him to give you, or you just have to accept the forgiveness that he's already provided. He's standing with an umbrella in the rain, and all you have to do is walk under the forgiveness that he's provided you. Jesus doesn't have to die again tomorrow for your sins. He's a, he already completed the whole task. Jesus, at the end, he said, it is finished. It's a completed work. We just have to accept the gift. And taking on all the sin, it meant a separation from the Father. This is what Jesus is stressed out about. See, sin separates us from God. While on the cross, Jesus made seven statements. I'll do a series on that someday. And one of the things that he said is, Father, why have you forsaken me? Because Jesus is so covered in sin and pain and mistakes that are you and I's that God had to look away from his own son. So Jesus is stressed and overwhelmed and saddened because of this pressure. The stress of the looming crucifixion and the pressure on taking on our collective sin, being separated from God, it was crushing him in the Garden of Olives. I don't really have time, but you know the way that you get the oil out of the olive is through a crushing. The olive has to put itself in a position to be crushed. Jesus put himself in a position in the Olive Garden to be crushed, and out of him flowed the anointing. Out of him flowed something that was great, and in our lives, sometimes in the crushing, if we stay faithful in the process, the best things will start to flow out of us. So I know it's hard right now, but stay faithful. I know it's hard right now, but believe that God's going to bring greater things to you. It said in the verse that he was sweating blood. It's kind of weird. There's a lot of documented cases of this throughout history, and I don't have time to go into all the science behind it, even though I have to admit I super geeked out this week reading on it all. Essentially, Jesus is in so much emotional and eternal pressure that blood capillaries begin to burst in his face. We've seen this before. Maybe you've uh, done something and you've had a blood capillary burst in one of your eyes or seen someone with that and they have like a red spot in their eye, a capillary burst. A lot of power lifters, when they're deadlifting something really heavy, they'll get a nosebleed. There's these, the, the blood pressure, the capillaries begin to burst and this is what's happening to Jesus. He's literally sweating drops of blood. And I was thinking about it this week and praying about the story. I realized that these were actually the first drops of blood that Jesus shed for our sins. Right. 
the blood that Jesus shed did not start at someone else's hand. It started with his willingness to follow the Father's will. He accepted what was happening. We think that the blood only came from the cross, but it happened before the handcuffs. It happened before the spear. It happened before the crown of thorns. Jesus sweated out. He could have ran. He, know he knows they're coming. He knows Judas is the dude about to come and betray him. He could have dipped. He could have got on that donkey and rode back out of town before they captured him. But yet he understood what needed to happen. He knew Judas was coming, but he stayed faithful. And sometimes we have to sweat it out. Don't give up while you're sweating. God knows where you are. And your resurrection's coming. He sees exactly where you are. Don't give up. Then uh, he goes to his disciples to wake him up one last time in Matthew 26. It says, while he was still speaking, he saw some torches in the distance coming towards him. He heard the stomping of some soldiers' feet. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now... The betrayer, Judas, had arranged a signal with them, the crowd, and he told them this, the one I kiss is the man, arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, greetings, rabbi, and he kissed him. Luke 22, but Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the son of man with a kiss? Matthew 26, 50, then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. So now Jesus' obedience has just put him in a situation that feels out of control. With that, one of Jesus' companions, Peter, reached for his sword, drew it, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Cutting off his ear? What? Put back your sword in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. For you think I cannot call on my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Jesus is saying, hey, Peter, put your little weak sword away. Don't you know that there's like 12 whole armies of angels in heaven that all I have to do is say the word? God. Peter's crazy, and he's probably the disciple that I most relate to in the story. Because sometimes I pull out my sword thinking I'm going to fix the problem myself. And all I can do with my power is chop off one dude's ear. (laughs) It's like a whole gang of guys there with swords and clubs, the Bible says. He cuts off one dude's ear. Sometimes the hardest thing for us to do is just not fight. Jesus says, if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. And if you live by your own power, you'll die only with your own power. But we have to trust who God is. And so Jesus bends down, picks the dude's ear up, and like, glues it back on. It's like, just it's healed. He just heals the dude's ear. I can imagine everyone's like, wait, what? Why are we arresting this guy? But they take him anyways, and he's arrested. Matthew 26, 56. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. So now he's really alone. He's like alone, alone. Luke 22. Then they seized him, and they led him away, bringing him to the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. So like I said, Peter's kind of crazy. And so everybody runs away. They take Jesus in handcuffs to the high priest's house. And Peter's sneaking around like from bush to bush and tree to tree and hiding behind rocks to see what happens. And they get to the courtyard of the high priest's house. Uh, The Bible tells us that the guards that were holding him, they put a bag over his head. And the guards start punching Jesus in the face with a bag on his head and saying, hey, Hey, prophet, tell us who hit you. They start mocking Jesus. They're spitting on him and disrespecting him, and over Haydn, far over by the fire, is Peter. And Peter's watching all of this happen. He's seeing his Lord getting beaten and dishonored. And as Peter's sitting there, a servant girl sees Peter. And she says, I, uh, I recognize you. I think I saw you yesterday with Jesus. You're one of his followers. And Peter says, no, I'm not. 
She says, yeah, I saw you yesterday with Jesus. You've got to be one of his followers. Peter says, no, get out of here. That's not me. The lady walks by one more time and looks at, you know how you kind of recognize somebody? She's looking at Peter and she says, I know it's you. And he says, it's not me, I don't even know the man. Now he's in the same courtyard as Jesus, sitting by a fire, and it says this, Luke 22, verse 61, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. They take the bag off Jesus' face. Peter yells, I don't even know the man, and Jesus turns and he looks at him. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Jesus was alone in the garden, but now he's really fully alone. What I've learned in my life is that denying Jesus for self-preservation always leads to sorrow. Anytime I deny Jesus that I don't know him or I'm not going to follow him or I'm going to choose not to invite somebody to Easter because I don't want them to think something weird about me. <laughs> it always leads to my own sorrow. Right. So Peter runs off and he runs away. It's a whole other story. I'll preach it next Easter. They have restoration and Jesus accepts him back after the resurrection, but it leads to this moment of sorrow. So now Jesus, he has to stand trial. Jesus has three trials that he stands in front of the next morning. This was happening all on Thursday and Thursday night, right? The last supper was Thursday night. Jesus up all night praying. He's now arrested, punched in the face. Peter runs. It's now Friday morning. Court opens. The first court he stands in front of is called the Sanhedrin. These are the religious leaders, the high priests. And these guys found him guilty of high treason because Jesus had said that he was the son of God and the Messiah and that he would eventually tear the temple down and rebuild it in three days. Well, they get bent out of shape about that right? Because it's going against their money-making venture that they're leading. And so they want to murder Jesus. But the religious leaders can't murder Jesus because that goes against Moses' law. So they want the Romans to do it. So they send Jesus to another trial to a guy named Pilate. And Pilate was the Roman governor of the region. And Pilate, he says, I find nothing wrong with this man. He says, just because y'all don't like him doesn't mean that I'm going to kill him for you. Really, Pilate didn't want the political backlash of killing Jesus, and so he does what all politicians do. He finds a loophole, and he realizes that Jesus was born in a different region, and so that he shouldn't have jurisdiction. So he sends him up the pipeline to his third trial to Herod, Herod the king. Now, there were six different Herods in the Bible. Herod's not only a name, but a position. And so this Herod who's the same guy that beheaded John the Baptist, was actually looking forward to meeting Jesus because he wanted to make Jesus perform some miracles for him. He wanted Jesus to be like a clown and do some tricks. Well, Jesus shows up and refuses to participate, and Herod says, well, I don't find anything wrong with this guy. I can't kill him. But before he sends him away, he has him beaten again. And they strip him naked, and they put on him a expensive kingly robe. Remember, Herod's the king, of Rome. So he has all this wealth. So he puts this elaborate golden robe on Jesus, and now Jesus is sent back to Pilate again. And as Jesus stands back before Pilate, he's betrayed even again. It says this in Matthew 27. Now, it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner to the crowd anyone they wanted. Remember how uh, everyone was trying to get Trump to pardon Tiger King, (laughs) and he didn't do it? This this is what would happen. Every single year, the governor would pardon someone, and they would be released. This year, there was a notorious prisoner, and his name was Barabbas. And as the crowd gathered before Pilate's home that morning, he asked them, the crowd, Which one of you do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Messiah? He knew very well that the religious leader had arrested Jesus out of envy. So you see the picture? Jesus comes back from Herod, beaten, and he's standing there before Pilate. And Pilate comes out before the crowd and he says, Do you want me to release Jesus or the murderer? Do you want me to release Jesus? This guy who's been walking the hillside and healing and feeding people and teaching? Or do you want me to release this guy who's actually a murderer? 
Do you want to release this holy man or this sinful man? You want to release the guy that brought Lazarus back to life, and y'all saw that, or this guy who's been killing people? The story goes on. It says, meanwhile, this is happening. The leading priests and elders persuaded the crowd. The elders are walking around the crowd saying, yell Barabbas. Yell Barabbas. Let's kill Jesus. Meanwhile, the leading priests and elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas to be released and for Jesus to be put to death. So, the governor Pilate asked again, which of these two do you want me to release to you? And the crowd shouted back, Barabbas! They chose Barabbas. I said that Jesus was betrayed again because the same crowd that cheered for him yesterday, taking off their jackets and cutting down palm branches, singing Hosanna, is the same crowd that's saying crucify him the next day. Don't find your affirmation from the crowd. The crowd changes. Your Instagram followers change. Your friends, they change. But we have to be paying attention to what the will of the Father is. It goes on, it says, Pilate saw that he wasn't getting anywhere and that a riot was, oh wait, I skipped it. Verse 22, Pilate responded, then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? They shouted back, crucify him. Why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. The mob very rarely has good judgment. (laughs) As a matter of fact, this mob is shouting lines they've been fed by the very people that are oppressing them. The mob has been fed content by the guys that are getting paid money so they would bring them sacrifices. Don't get mad at the mob. Get mad at the leadership of the mob. I don't got time for that. (laughs) Verse 24. Pilate saw that he wasn't getting anywhere and that the riot was developing, so he sent for a bowl of water. He gets this big basin of water. He puts his hands in front of the crowd and he says, and I washed my hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. The responsibility is yours. And all the people yelled back, we will take responsibility for his death, we and our children. So Pilate released Barabbas to them. And he ordered Jesus to be flogged with a lead-tipped whip. And they turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Next week, we're going to talk about the crucifixion of Jesus. But put that picture of Barabbas and Jesus back up for me. There's Barabbas. But put, there's this moment, as I think about the story of Barabbas, Barabbas should have been the one to die. But instead, Jesus takes his place. Barabbas was a convicted man. But yet in this moment, they take the chains off of Barabbas and they let him go. Barabbas was a murderer. And so my philosophy after study is that the cross that Jesus hung on was actually built and prepared for Barabbas. Can you imagine being Barabbas? You're on death row. And all of a sudden, you get pulled out of the prison. You're standing there before a crowd, and they're chanting your name to set you free. And they unlock, unlatch the handcuffs and the chains, and you just walk out and see like your gangster buddies. You're like, yeah, I got out. I'm free, dog. What's up, right? Barabbas is set free to go and live his life. Meanwhile, Jesus hangs on the cross that was meant for him. Me and Barabbas have a lot in common. Me and Barabbas, we're a lot alike. Because I was living in a prison of sin based upon my own bad decisions. And I was destined for death. Not just a physical death, but a spiritual death separated from God. But then out of nowhere, this guy named Jesus shows up. And Jesus says, no, 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 let trust and free. I'll hang on his cross. I'll take his beating. I'll take the whips so that he can be healed. And you and I, we have a lot in common with Barabbas. 
all have sinned and fallen short of the goodness of God. But God loved us so much that he sent his one and only son to die on a cross. And that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will be set free and have everlasting life. That day, as Jesus stood before the crowd, there was another crowd watching, and it was the crowd of heaven. And the Father is in heaven looking down on what's happening. And the Father allows Jesus to take the punishment that Barabbas deserved. And God's still doing the same thing today. He's doing the same thing. And so if you walk in today and you feel far from God, you feel distant from heaven, can I tell you that God wants nothing more than to be in close relationship with you? That the reason that Jesus went through what he went through on the cross was not just for me, but was equally for you. And so if you're here and you're far from God, you don't have to be. I'd ask that everybody in the room would close their eyes and bow their heads. And if I'm talking to you, and you feel a tug in your heart that you want to get right with God, you can today. On the count of three, all I'm going to do is ask you to raise your hand if you want to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and come into your heart. The scripture says it's destined unto all men once to die and after that the judgment. And someday we're all going to stand before our maker. And we either stand there covered in our own sin or we stand there covered in the forgiveness that Jesus provided. All you have to do is ask for him to forgive you, and he will. So on the count of three, if you want to ask Jesus into your heart, just raise your hand up. I'm not going to make you stand up or nothing. We're just going to pray a prayer that God would forgive you of your sins. So that's you on the count of three. Raise it up. One, two, three. That's you this morning. Yep, all over the room. I see you over here. Yep, over here I see you. Yep, right here in the middle. Yep, all along the side. I see you. Hold on. Yes, sir, I see you. Yep, in the back I see you. Yep, I see you, bro. Anybody else say, today is my day. I want to ask Jesus into my heart. Living Church, would you pray with me and all those that raise their hands this morning? Everyone pray this after me. Dear God, forgive me my sin and come into my heart. Make me new. Set me free. From this day forward, I'm going to follow you. I believe you gave your life so I could find mine. I love you, God. Thank you for loving me. Amen. Would you put your hands together for all those that prayed that prayer with us this morning? Now, if you prayed that prayer before you leave, now don't, I got one more thing I want to say, but before you leave, we're going to give you a Bible. In the back, we've got a free Bible that we want to give you. Just talk to you and answer any questions you have. Pastor Whitney is going to come in just a minute and talk a little bit more like that, but there's one more thing. So Jesus... So Jesus was abandoned and betrayed and arrested and lied about and beaten and mocked and falsely accused and sentenced to death. But I want you to notice one thing about his character. You get the story? You with, everybody's with me still? I want you to notice about his character. Jesus, he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. And do you notice his actions throughout the whole process? Not once did it say that Jesus cussed somebody out. Not once does it say Jesus punched a guard in the face. Not once does it say that Jesus tried to escape the situation. You see, Jesus died to be our Savior, but he lived to be our example. And he gives us this example of how to carry ourselves in the harshest of situations. And in God's will, for you, there might be moments that are uncomfortable. But when we keep the long game of obedience in mind, we remember that we're always in the best place. Scripture says that because Jesus became obedient to death, even death on a cross, that God elevated him above the name that is above every name. Can I tell you that for you, stay faithful in your heartache? Stay faithful, Dad. Fight back for your patience, Mom. You can do it. Stay faithful. Keep serving, LC. I know you're tired. Keep serving God's house. Keep giving into the kingdom. 
Stay faithful in what God's called you to do. Because as we're faithful in the hardest times, our elevation comes. It's where God blesses us from. And as we've been hearing, learning about how, how to hear from God, what's an area that you need to continue to submit to his will? What's the thing that God's been speaking to you but you're afraid to listen to? I hope you've been doing the homework. Remember I had my little chair out here with my little rug and my little uh, footstool and I was out here talking about how to hear from God. As God's been speaking, it's obedience time. Whatever he's been telling you, step into. If it's a sin issue you need to deal with, come on and deal with it, man. If it's a relational issue, work on it. If it's finances or stepping into evangelism or serving, I promise that advancement follows your obedience. That his name was lifted above every other name because he was faithful in the heartache. And I love you guys so much. I believe in y'all so much. There's no other church in the world I'd rather be the pastor at. I don't care who I got a phone call from, I wouldn't leave. I'm so thankful to be here with you guys. Let me pray for you before we go. God, we love you. We know that you've called us to do something great for your kingdom. And God, I, help, I ask that you would help me and help all of us to continually follow your will. Not our feelings, not our wants, but what you have for us. We thank you, God, for loving us so much. In your name we all said, amen. Come on, give the Lord a shout this morning. Good. What a great word this morning. I'm so grateful to be learning all the story and all the details and how it applies to our life. What a great message today. Don't miss a week of this series. Be back each and every week as we lead up to Easter, learning the full Easter story. It's a whole lot more than eggs. If you prayed that prayer this morning and you asked Jesus into your heart, can I just tell you, it's the greatest decision you ever made. And it's not the end. It's just the beginning of what God wants to do in your life. And we want to be on the journey with you. It's our heart that no one would walk alone, but that we're all in this together. And so after service, you can stop by the table in the back. We have some elders there who would love to connect with you. And we have a Bible that we'd love to give you. This is the roadmap for the relationship with Jesus. This is the first a step in knowing him and knowing his word and so we have that for you in the back but I want to encourage you and, and all of you here at Living Church we're stepping into a season of building of ourselves of really knowing what God has created us to do of tearing some things down and building some things back up and so a few weeks ago Pastor Trust and I shared about the next season of Living Church and what God has asked us to do in that season and so if you weren't here and you weren't able to take home a hammer to symbolically say I commit to tear down and to build up in this season we have them in the back as you leave today I'd love for everyone to take them you can put them on your mantle we've already received pictures of people who've got them in special places around their home to remind themselves to really decide to lean in and to hear from God and then to step forward and be obedient to what he said you know, on Tuesdays and Thursday nights, we have discipleship classes. A whole new round is starting next week. And I encourage you, go online, register, and be a part as you take a step forward into building yourself into more of what God's called you and asked you to be. And Easter is just a few weeks away, and you don't want to miss it. You want to be here, bring your whole family. Y'all going to look cute, take a great picture together. But more importantly, bring somebody with you. We have invite cards in the back and door hangers and yard cards that you can put a sign in your yard. If you live on a golf course like me, y'all got to take two. You got to put one in the front and one in the back so you can invite the golfers so they can come and know the love of Jesus. But I encourage you this week, take these cards, invite somebody. Everybody's looking for a place to go this year. They didn't get to go last year and wear the cute outfit and take a cute family photo. They're looking for somewhere. This year is the easiest year ever to invite somebody and say, hey, you can sit with me. There's plenty of space. We're going to be uh, here for three services, 8, 30, 10, and 11, 30 on Easter Sunday morning. And it's going to be an incredible time together as a church family. And so I'm just challenge you and invite you to lean in. Build yourself up. Be a part of all the more that God has for you this year at Living Church. We love you guys so much. We'll see you next Sunday. Have a great week.